Um, I, I guess really I was kind of brought in today, I mean, not being directly in the music world, but working in film and television. A lot of what I do is directing music videos and creating video content for uh, bands, for artists. Uh, and, and that could be anything from getting hired to create a series of web blogs uh, for a band that they want to release weekly. Uh, that could be going on tour with bands. And back in the day, before, before pre-YouTube, I used to be a lot of touring with bands to create sort of DVD content. There was an era where a lot of what they talked about today is, is you know, declining CD sales. And, and there was a, a short-lived period where uh, Sony Music tried to put uh, packaged DVDs or dual discs with their CDs. And it was a way to try to, don't download it, you know, don't steal this record. If you buy it, you're going to get a, a DVD that you can't see anywhere else. So I would get, uh, that was a very profitable way for me to, to get into it. But I think also I got asked to talk today because I can relate to the sort of the struggling artists and trying to be an independent band or an independent musician or producer because the film world is not far removed from that. And especially for those of you that live here in Windsor, I mean, I grew up in Amherstburg, which is even smaller than Windsor. I always refer to it like the line in uh, Star Wars. Um, you know, if there's a, a bright center of the universe, then Amherstburg is the planet that is furthest from. Meaning in terms of entertainment, you couldn't be any further away from Hollywood if you tried. You know, uh, to my left was cattle, to my right was, you know, a, well, you should go get a factory job because that's what everyone else does here, so that's, that's your future. And I just decided to sort of fight against that, and, but I had no idea how I was going to do that. And uh, living so close to, you know, Detroit, Detroit's right there through this wall, uh, there's, you know, amazing entertainment opportunities there. Most of us, if we go see big concerts, we usually go see them in Detroit or Toronto, but Detroit's a lot closer. So I thought, you know what, all I need to do is meet some artists at, at a bigger level that I can convince them to let me do work for them. I'm like, well, how do I do that? So I just, uh, at the time, before the A Channel was the A Channel, they were the new WI uh, here in Windsor, which I think was the new PL in London and whatever it is up in, in Barrie, and I, the new VR, and I made a fake uh, new WI pass. And I just started going to concerts with, with a little rinky-dink camcorder and a microphone trying to convince people that I was there to interview the band and somehow I didn't get on the media list and oh my god I'm gonna lose my job if I don't get this TV interview and uh, the first one that I really pulled that off with is the rock band Third Eye Blind who, who sort of had the height of their fame in uh, the late 1990s and, and early 2000s so that was that was back in t almost 10 years ago in 2003 mm -hmm. and I I managed to get in they said okay the singer will give you an interview for for five minutes or whatever so we ended up interviewing him for about an hour and then one of the radio DJs that I did some website work from, from DRQ Radio that used to be in Detroit was there. And he said, oh, hold on, I'll get you a pass. Do you want to film some clips of the, the concert? And just by, you know, little little serendipitous moment on the pass, you know, they forgot to check off that I was only there for the first three songs and checked all access. So I just got to hang out all night. And I filmed the whole concert, met the bass player who ended up writing movie for my first, or music for my first movie a few years later. Um, but became friends with the singer there, got his email, got a label, somebody from the label's email, because I said, oh, I want you guys to see the interview, thinking they get interviewed every night, they're never going to see it. And I, I went home and I stayed up all night, you know, a couple of Red Bulls later, I had finished this little five minute video piece about the band with my interview segments, the live stuff that I had, and I sent it to their label. And I got a call the very next day from the singer saying, hey, this is Stephen Jenkins from Third Eye Blind, who, who I thought it was my business partner pulling a prank, and I just, I actually, Click, hung up, called back, said, I'm calling for Gavin Booth. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 you know, and, uh, and I got hired on the spot to go out on tour with them and create their tour DVD. And that was sort of my, my big break, which like, so, so everything that people talk about, taking every opportunity that you have and finding some innovative way to get in there, it really is just about breaking in and never, I mean, I don't know why half of you guys didn't chase Carl Wolf out into the hall and at least introduce yourself. Like, that's the kind of stuff that you have to do because it might not mean anything today, but the next time you bump into him or when you email him and say, hey, I've been working on this song. Is there any way I can get somebody at, at your new management company to listen to it? There'll at least be that spark of, oh, I met this person here and they were very polite and friendly. Like, so I've always lived by just taking any, any opportunity ever. Uh, this year, I'm about to direct sort of my first studio level movie and that came that all came out of a cold email that I wrote to somebody um, I found this new distribution company in Canada and I said well you know what they'll probably take I, I have this fairly risky project that nobody else seems to like everybody likes but doesn't want to take the risk and uh, I said you know what I'll just I'm gonna find his email and I tracked it down through you know playing the six degrees of who knows anybody who works at this company and wrote just a very polite professional email and I got a call again I went to Toronto and met and instantly signed a deal for it so 
There is no, I cannot speak enough about how important it is to just go out there, send these cold emails, meet anybody and network all that you can. Um, I know Carl said that he really didn't do any networking, but I think I really believe it's the opposite. You've got to always sort of be on your toes and always be out there doing something. And then the other side with what I do is creating content is always, uh, you know, last year we did 26 music videos and I never really wanted to be a music video director. I had directed about four music videos previous to 2011, just for friends, bands, people that said, hey, uh, you know, we've got this song and I, and I kind of always said, I don't want to do music videos, but I would end up getting coaxed into doing it. And it, it was fun, but I never, I never really saw it as a career path until uh, my film deal that I have kept, the film production keeps getting delayed. And I can't sign to do another film because they'll, they'll end up conflicting schedule-wise. So I just started, well, I might as well fill the time with music videos. They're kind of shorter form. I, I can just do whatever. And we ended up doing 26 music videos. And again, by not saying no and saying yes to the opportunities that have presented to me, some of these music videos have led to some of the biggest opportunities of my life. I now have an agent in Los Angeles for music videos that I signed with recently because she saw one of my music videos and tracked me down and called me instantly. So I've been, I haven't, I've only booked one project through her so far, but that was to work with The Dream, the singer and songwriter who wrote hits like Beyonce's Single Ladies and Rihanna's Umbrella. And I got to go to LA and film a documentary about him. So just, again, all, all from saying yes instead of saying no to opportunity. Um, there's a music video actually, Todd Arkell, who's going to be speaking next, I, he manages an artist, Robin Delantu, who I had heard one of her songs, kind of some friends had said, hey, you should do a video for her. And again, cold email, found out her email, and she said, oh, you have to talk to my manager, Todd. And I thought, oh, this is, this is, I'm getting the brush off. And, uh, you know, I ended up doing that music video, and that, again, that cold email has turned into, now I've directed four music videos for various artists that Todd manages. And you know we're talking about other projects down the road, and Todd's you know now um, very helpful in connecting me. But there's a, there's a, one band in particular, Amos the Transparents. Uh, right now, I don't know how often you guys go to the movies, but at Cineplex right now, there's there's the pre-show that plays before every movie. Amos the Transparent is the band that's being interviewed during that um, during that segment, and there's clips from a music video that we shot here in Windsor. Some of the people here today actually worked crew on that video and it's, it's now playing on, on the Jumbotron. So if somebody would have said to me a year ago, oh yeah, one of your music videos will be playing in you know, Silver Cities all across Canada. It's just, it's just, it's hard to sort of imagine where opportunity comes from. But if you just keep constantly pushing and putting content out there, you know, you'll get it. Which to me, being a band, the easiest way to market yourself, and that's why I wanted to ask Carl Wolf the question about social networking, because it really is everything and it starts very small. You start a Facebook page for your band, you start a YouTube channel and you get one video up and maybe you get 50 views, maybe you get 100 views. Okay, so the goal should be maybe the next video we can get 150 views, you know, and it's just trying to slowly build. What he said about the nucleus I think was the, was the best thing. You just want to keep attracting as much energy and stuff um, to what you're doing. And I think being a band, I mean, there's no excuse to not have video content online. YouTube is free. You know, you can get a flip cam or if, if you've got an iPhone or any kind of smartphone that's got a video mode on it, it's all HD. It shoots as good as half the professional cameras do these days. There's music videos being shot on iPhones. Like, it's not about the limitations of the gear. Oh, it'd be great to have a studio. It'd be great to have this camera and this microphone. Like, uh, you know, just move beyond those limitations because the importance is most of your fans, most of the people watching, don't understand any of that. And all they're interested in is the content. If you have people out there that love your music and sort of love your personalities in the band, they want to see that. They want to know what you guys do in your free time. They, they would love to see a glimpse of you recording in the studio and talking about your new album or maybe just sitting on a couch in a living room talking about where, you know, the, you have a song that's got some attention and people say, oh, I really love that song. Tell people what that song means to you and where that song came from. But the point is, to just continuously put out content because it'll just keep building. And again, you never know who's watching. Some of the, uh, some of the opportunities that have come out of video blogging for me are just, are just phenomenal in terms of you know, artists that I've had call and say, hey, we saw your uh, behind the scenes blog for this. There's actually, I can't discuss all the details of it, but the same band, Amos the Transparent, with a lot of the music videos that I do, we always do a behind the scenes. We do like a little seven minute featurette about the making of the music video which is great for the band, they get content, and it's sort of a seven minute commercial for why you should hire Gavin Booth to direct your music video. But uh, one of these, w the making of the Sure the Weather video just got selected to be shown at a fairly prestigious event, and uh, you know, I, I never would have thought the behind the scenes of a music video would end up 
being played on a big screen somewhere and attracting more and more attention. It's just, it, it's, it is true. What everyone here today, the common thread I see is that if you just keep creating and keep pushing all avenues, that's sort of the, the most important thing to do. And I mean, like, I mean, it, it, and networking's key. I've already been asking who's doing his next music video and if there's an opportunity for me to write concepts for it because he's, <laughs> exactly. But um, you, you have to because that's the other sad truth. No one is going to care about your passion as much as you do. It doesn't matter, all the managers in the world, all the labels in the world, all the booking agents in the world, no one cares about what you want to do and what you want to show the world artistically as much as you do. So I, as much as I said, you know, I signed with an agent in LA. I booked one gig from her so far. It's great, I get to write on a bunch of stuff and writing music videos is sometimes like auditioning for an actor or trying to, trying to get gigs as a musician. You just kind of keep applying, you keep trying until you, you break through. So I've only booked one gig, meaning that was in June. So if June 2011 I said, okay, I have an agent now, I'm just gonna, the work's just gonna come in. I would have no income. I wouldn't have directed you know, most of the music videos that I did last year. I would have just sat there and, think, and lost all that momentum. So I think sometimes people look at those things as a safety net. Oh, I have these people working for me now. That's the end all be all. But I mean, it should be a team building thing. If, if you have a manager, if you're a band and you have a manager like Todd, then you, you know, Todd's working hard for you. But if you can be networking and finding other opportunities, you still want to collaborate with that manager and say, hey, Todd, I was talking to somebody and, and divert that back to your professional team. But the more, you know, it's, it's just the more, the more hooks in the water, the more fish you're going to catch. So I think a lot of bands, especially if you have three or four people in a band, there's no reason that there's not 20 minutes a day, you know, at a minimum, if not an hour a day. If this is what you really want to do. Nobody would get to the NBA. Nobody would train to go to the Olympics by sitting around going like, well, I could, I could swim for 20 minutes today, I guess, but I've got this party to go to and I've got this, you know, I want to watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy on Blu-ray that just came out and this is more important. Like if you, if you want to do something, you can't, you, it's like, if, you know, if you want to get in shape and you want to go to the gym, you can't say, you can't make excuses constantly. You have to, if this is your passion, this is what you, you know, um, I have to ask Marie, what's the quote that you love, the John Mayer quote? Because it's one of the best quotes I've heard in the last few years. Yeah, talk is cheap. Do. Be doing. Nobody cares to hear, oh, we're trying to do this. We just show them. Just keep putting content out. Keep playing shows. Keep building that, that fan page. And, uh, you know, somebody else was talking to me about it today, and it's very true that, you know, a lot of artists, by the time a label comes around and says, hey, we're interested in signing you, they're probably already built up to a point that they don't even necessarily need a label and could stay independent. It's just kind of one of those sad ironies that, you know, sometimes labels are looking, they, they like to look at sure bets. They're a business. They don't like to take risks. Why would they? That's not a smart business move. It's not a, a calculated risk. So you are always going to have to sort of create content on your own. And like I said about the idea of the iPhone and stuff, I mean, I almost shoot myself in the foot every time I have one of these talks, but like, you don't necessarily, you know, need me or need to hire a professional videographer to do a video. That's, that's cool and that's one way to go, but videos nowadays, if, if you're okay with doing something that you don't mind that it looks a little cheaper, it's shot on a MacBook camera, it's shot on a cell phone camera, you can come up with a concept that people will, you know, people will respond to. And you always kind of have to work out the math of it. What are you spending on creating it versus what is the impact that you're creating? You know, if you, if you make a music video for, I don't know, a, a low budget music video for $1,000 and 1,000 people saw it, okay, well you just spent a dollar to get everyone to, to listen to your, or to see your, hear your music. Maybe that's not the most effective, because you could also go out on the street and probably say, I'll give you a loony if you listen to me talk about my band for a minute and have much better interaction with that person to tell them about the band. But if you push that video hard that you made for $1,000 and you get 10,000 people to watch it, well then you just paid you know, a dime to catch each person's attention. So you just always try to do the math. You know, I think it's, it's scary sometimes when you got to record albums, press albums. I also don't understand why anybody's making CDs anymore. If you're currently in the studio about to release a record, make drop cards, put it on iTunes, don't make CDs. They're not going to exist in two or three years. You know, everyone likes to fall in love with the romantic aspect of it, like, oh, I like the way I hold it and I get the liner notes. It just, it doesn't matter, it's dead. You know, like it, you know, people, you didn't hear people clinging onto VHS when it was, when it was falling away and going to DVD and it's just, it's not going to be there. So why, why keep going with a shrinking you know, portion of the music industry, it's also cheaper to make drop cards than it is to make 
albums, you know? So just, just try to be a little innovative. What's the first thing, I mean, who here, other than maybe in their car with a CD player, what's the first thing you do with a CD? You take it, you rip it to your computer or your iPod or, you know, some of you unfortunately bought a Zoom player and then, uh, and then that's it. And that's, that's where it stays and that's where the content stays digital. And I mean, literally, I don't even keep physical CDs anymore. I just put them in the garbage because there's no shelf space for them anymore. Um, and it's just going to become more and more like that. So the idea of physically pressing a CD to me seems like a waste of money when you could spend less to make drop cards. You could actually probably get five times as many drop cards for the same price as, you know, so you get five times as many physical albums, which means, okay, well, we're going to sell a thousand, but now we've got four thousand we can give away. To everybody who ever comes to our concerts for the next six months, a year, we're going to give them a free album. And that's, that's the whole thing, like your actual music any music video, any song nowadays, really to me, and again, I don't run the music industry, I don't work for a label, is kind of an advertising tool to get people to see you live. Because that's where you can make money, selling your merch, selling your concert tickets, and that's how you, you build and grow a fan base. So every song, every single, every music video is a commercial for people to go find out more about your band and then hopefully come see you live or support you in, in some other way than the traditional model of, of album sales. Um, I think I've rambled through just about everything I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> so I tend to talk very fast, so sorry if I'm just jut jutting through this. But if there's questions out there, I mean, I'd love to take, love to take questions. I want to play devil's advocate on CDs. All right. Okay, so since we okay old people like CDs. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's totally Yeah. But I honestly believe, I mean, we still make them. I'm just thinking five years down the road. So. Yeah, probably 12 months down the road, possibly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, right now, today. All you have to do is go to HMV and look at here's the music section, and now we sell Angry Birds plush dolls, yes. books, <laughs> and HMV, you know. And it's sad. I yeah. don't even go into record stores anymore because I close. There's no records to look at anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think any, anything like so many bands, Bare Naked Ladies, one arguably, you know, it's not even arguably, one of the biggest bands to ever come out of Canada launched their career with a cover song, you know, uh, Lovers in a Dangerous Time. And so there's, there's all kinds of bands that have got their breakout because of a cover song, and that's great, but that can't be all you have. There has to be the backup, you know, there has to be a plan. We, we have our own songs, we have an album ready to go. Um, Walk Up the Earth. Todd and I actually go back and forth about this all the time, discussing it. Uh, is everybody familiar with this? The band that like stood around one guitar and all five members played played the one guitar. It's like a cover of an Australian singer's song. People know it, but they don't remember the band name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 90 million people saw the video, and then, you know, right? And they're like, yeah. oh, that was cool, thanks, next. It's kind of like Super Bowl commercials for me. Like, oh yeah, that, that beer commercial. I don't remember which brand it was. It was just a funny commercial. But they, you know, that's obviously, that they played the Ellen Show. They've got managers and labels and all these people talking to them. But if you actually go on their YouTube, and, and this is, again, just my opinion, but if you go on their YouTube, their original material does not live up to the covers that they've created. So they, you know, it's, there's really kind of like the break, you, you hit a wall there. There's not, what do you do? But I mean, but at the same time, with that level of interest, they can have access to the best songwriters and the best producers and things like that to create music. So. I, The 
to think that a band that has no material and no history can sign a major record label deal, and all that is is the label says, guess what? We can make money out of this right now. The mm -hmm. iTunes sale, sales of their version of Gautier's song are massive, absolutely massive. So that, it's a cash grab for the label. And if they, they may never even get a record deal from that perspective, but now they just, I can't even fathom a band that spent 18 months building up their reputation and the amount of YouTube views, the amount of money they make off of YouTube they signed all the way out. I was stunned, absolutely stunned that they would actually give it all up for that. Mm -hmm. You know what, they don't have anything. They don't have anything in the tank. And I, I mean, I wish them well because they have a great band. I think it's crashing their there's, there's a few bands I know. I even have friends in bands that basically all they do is these cover, and they make these little music videos of cover songs, and like, yeah, we got 54,000 hits, we got 100,000 views on YouTube, but it's like, that's someone else's success, because people are finding that because of the fact that they know the original song. That it's kind of a, it's kind of like a, a fake celebrity. It's like being on a reality show and being called an actor or a celebrity, you know? It's not the same thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. How do you turn that into a business of your own? Exactly. It's a great start. I mean, I had, last summer, I don't know, living in Windsor, there was the surprise wedding that happened. I don't know if you read about this. Groom threw a surprise wedding. His bride had no idea she was getting married that day. That happens to be one of my best friends. Uh, Marie sat here. We actually filmed it. I threw it on YouTube for his friends and family to see that couldn't make it. And boom, million hits in a couple days. We're flown to New York doing all this press and everything. And there were all these people coming at them too, the, bri the bride group saying, like, this could be a book. You, you could write a self-help book about how to be more, Mr. Romantic, you know, you can be, uh, there could be a reality show where you, you help couples reignite the spark with, with surprise events and everything. And it's just like, but they're, you know, they're, they're not business minded. There was nowhere to sort of take that. And it just, and then of course, three days later, it's not news anymore. So like, if you, if you can't back it up immediately, it'll just fade away. <coughs> I think original original materials king. There's nothing wrong with playing a live show and doing a cover or two if you like it, especially if it's a cover that you know the audience likes. You always see it if there's a I don't know Justin Bieber hit or a Katy Perry hit, and then some you know hardcore band will do their version of it. And it's kind of it's kind of funny. It's catchy, and people keep, people will talk about it. And that's that becomes a highlight of the show. But still, it shouldn't outshine the original material you're trying to do. I definitely don't think you should invest a lot of time. And doing covers, you know, and, and only re really do a cover of it if it means something. There, there's, there's a band in here that's going to do a cover on uh, on Wednesday, and the, but the idea behind it and the reason why they're doing the cover and the significance of the date they're releasing it is awesome, and that can bring wicked attention to their band. But their YouTube channel is full of original content, other than you know this this one video. So that that to me is a smart move. But it, it, and everything in this industry is just kind of a gamble. You don't. You never know what's going to work. You can, you can feel so sure that this is the single, this is the video concept that no one's ever done, but it, does it actually connect? Nobody can force something to go viral. That's just sort of, everyone tries to say, oh, we're trying to make a viral video. Well, no, the videos that go viral, they weren't trying to go viral. They just happened to make something that ended up becoming this phenomenon. So there's a bit of a myth of, around the idea of a viral video. You can, you can try to create something really original, but you, you don't get to determine if the public are going to like it and, and you know, share the hell out of it on Facebook and everything else. Are you gonna mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, uh, I mean, ha have lots of goals, have no expectations. I'm, uh, you know, the, the, the sad reality, yeah, I've, I've had some success, I'm about to make this, this bigger studio movie. I have four independent films I guarantee, like none of you have ever heard of or never seen, which is sad. You know, make this movie for $25,000 of my own money get everyone involved in it, the actors, everything. We actually sold the first one I did to a distribution deal. And then everything with internet hit and downloading and things started changing and now it's sitting on a shelf of a company that has no idea how to make money with this small independent film anymore because 
you know, you know, blockbusters fading, home videos going away. I had a second film, so I, I went on to a second film and said, okay, fine. It's sad the world can't even see that. I'm going to go make a second film. I did another one and self finance it. And we did some local screenings. It was, you know, it was pretty popular with the people that saw it. And I signed it away to a producer, said, I can get the soul, I can get a deal for it. He turns out to be a complete human piece of garbage. And, uh, and now it's, but it's stuck in a contract with him and I can't, I can't get the film back. So there's film two nobody's seen, you know? And it's like, the sad reality is it might take you, as a, as a band, as an artist, it could take you four or five albums. And then, you know, there's, there's the old adage of like, you know, over, an overnight success takes 10 years. And that I find is about the marker. Like I'm, I'm standing here, I'm 34 years old. I really kind of started and, and really got into doing the film thing when I was about 23, 24. And there's been a lot of, you know, really exciting peaks and things that have happened along the way and some networking, but it's all, you know, some of the contacts I made in 2003 are only just starting to come into play seriously in my life now because it's about building relationships too. You can't just expect, oh, I met that person. They said they like my stuff. They're going to help me now. You know, no, I mean, everybody has their own projects. Everybody has their own stuff. So it, it's really hard. The one thing that I always say is for every, you know, it, it's, a, it's almost like you get one success for every 99 disappointments. And even when I say disappointments, I'm talking about crushing disappointments <laughs> where you were promised that this was going to happen. You were going to make money. This was going to hit. You should do this. Work with this person. It'll work out amazing for you. And they don't. So like for that one thing out of 100, you have to like personally in yourself, if that one thing makes you so excited and so happy and so fulfilled that you're living your dream and this one thing that one thing has to make you so happy it carries you through the next 99 disappointments or like, you know, I honestly advise go do something else with your life. If you have a secondary passion that's actually a traditional career and can make money of that and be happy not pursuing music, do that because you will, you know, you will have more money, you will have more sleep, you will have more stable relationships, you will have, you know, you will have everything that is the, the, uh, the all American, North American dream outside of that, that artistic part. But, you know, I think the people that are sat here today, you've come here for a reason because you don't have that thing. You have the, I don't have the switch in my head where I could turn it off and go do something else. This is what I have to do, suffering or not. But expectations, it's about setting, setting small goals along the way towards that big one. And uh, I think, again, what Carl Wolf said, you know, kind of looking a year into the future instead of like, won't it be awesome when we play Wembley Stadium? It's like, okay, let's worry about getting our band from Windsor into a Toronto show once a month for the next the next year every two months or, or whatever however that works for touring you know just, just have manageable goals and as you reach each one always be setting more goals don't get don't hit that goal and not know where you want to take it from there i'm way over time you're going to cut me off yeah. <laughs> um, can you really ruin my book idea I want to write a book called The Artist Diet. The basic premise is, um, like anything, if you go on a diet, the, the major points of a diet are less calories in, more calories out. You know, eat less crap, intake less crap, put out more, you know, you know f physical fitness, go to the gym, do whatever it is. So being an artist, it's the same sort of thing. Don't watch that season of TV because you just bought it on DVD. Don't, you know, go to the bar three times a week. Don't do, you know, again, what Carl Wolf said, I like to stay at home and work on what I'm doing and just con continuously work. And the minute you start making all these excuses, oh, I can't get to the gym today, I can't work on my record, oh, I don't have time to go out and promote. Um, there's a band that's here today that goes door to door on the weekends and sells their album, knocking door to door. And they're making phenomenal amounts of money for very little work and they're getting constant exposure because they're forcing people to know who they are and, and what they are. And that's, that's what I would call healthy exercise, you know? And, and what are they doing? Well they're, well, they're, instead of going, when they're out doing that, they're not sitting around on the couch dreaming. They're not just, you know, hanging with their friends. They're not doing all that other, that other crap. So really, you, you have to be self-motivating because at the end of the day, everyone will listen to you and encourage you, but it, it all revolves around you and what, what you do. But if you keep talking about something that you want to do and you don't act on it, the people that are loyal and followers, even if they're family and, and close friends, We'll start to, you know, uh, he's been talking about that for five years, seven years, ten years. You know, they, they will stop supporting what you're trying to do. And these are the people that you need, you know, to believe in. So you have to be able to be self-motivating at all times. The same as any other career path, any, any other challenge or, or major thing in life that you want to do. It, it has to come from you and will always be about you pushing it.